Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So this panel is uh, focusing on making college more affordable for students, and it's a great segue from this outstanding presentation we just had, because obviously the challenge is how do we redirect our resources to accommodate not changes that we would like to do just because they would be fun to do, but because they're the new imperative. All of this is being driven by so many forces, let alone technology, but in our world, of course, the, the financing uh, of higher ed is a, has going through dramatic changes. That's forcing change. The way our students learn, obviously, is forcing a lot of change, and on and on. We have to do things differently. So we're going to try this panel to take a cut on how three different institutions are approaching the kind of change environment and change imperative um, that we're all facing. So let me introduce the panelists, please. Um, Dr. Kareen Faton is the Chancellor and President of Texas Woman's <laughs> College. She said to me, I don't care how you pronounce my name. Everybody says Kareen, Corinne, whatever she said, but I really care about pronouncing Texas Woman's not women's university. college and university, <laughs> Texas Women's University, TWU. So I've been educated already uh, by Dr. Fayton. Uh, and I also didn't realize that it was a public institution. Uh, its main campus is in Denton, and it has uh, health science centers in Dallas and Houston. She leads the largest university in the nation focused on the education of women with over 15,600 students, nearly 90% of whom are female, and 35% are graduate students. Uh, in 2017, TWU was rated one of the top five most diverse universities in the country by U.S. News and World Report. More than half are first-generation college students and half are eligible to receive Pell Grants. So she understands the community college context because we have very similar uh, demographics. Under Chancellor Faden's uh, leadership, The Economist ranked TWU 45th out of 1,275 institutions in the nation and second in Texas for adding value to its graduates' income earning potential. As we know, that's a, a big political uh, issue in our society today. The Dallas Business Journal ranked it first in the Dallas-Fort Worth region for its graduates' earning relative to the cost of attending TWU. Uh, prior to coming to TWU, Dr. Fayton was Dean of the College of Education, Health and Society at Miami University and Oxford University. Uh, for more than 20 years, she served in various leadership positions at the University of South Florida in Tampa, and uh, she holds a PhD in interdisciplinary education focused on second language acquisition and instructional technology from the University of South Florida. She also holds an MA in English, Dutch in education, and a BA in Germanic philology, both from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. A native of Belgium, Dr. Faiten is fluent in five languages. She's going to pick the language of her choice today, so we're just going to have to try to keep up with her. I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Lyons. Peter is Vice Provost and Dean of Perimeter College, which is formerly a community college, which has now been merged into the Georgia State University system. It's one of the largest degree-granting colleges in the nation. As Vice Provost and Dean, Lyons is the Executive Officer for the college and is responsible for academic, administrative research, and service functions. Before assuming the perimeter role in January of 2016, Lyons was the Associate Provost for Institutional Effectiveness at Georgia State and Professor of Social Work at the University's Andrew Young School of Policy Studies. And for those of you, particularly trustees that may not be aware of this, you, you heard uh, Jeff mention Georgia State uh, during his presentation, but Georgia State has um, uh, risen to a level of national recognition for the pathways work that they have been doing there, and they're really a national leader in this effort, so their uh, graduates' uh, numbers have risen quite dramatically, and they're part of the National Pathways model that several of us here in Texas uh, have been involved in. So Georgia State has received a great deal of attention for this uh, really new way in which they are organizing um, uh, curricula uh, and helping students to make their way deliberately through these pathways, and many of us are, are following in that same direction. Uh, as an Associate Provost for Institutional Effectiveness, uh, Dr. Lyons spearheaded the university's move to a single authorita authoritative data system 
uh, redesigned the academic program review and administrative unit review process and led the university through the accreditation related initiatives, always a challenge for any of us uh, in colleges and universities. And he coordinated the consolidation plan for Georgia Perimeter and Georgia State. Uh, his research and publications are in the areas of child maltreatment, risk assessment, program evaluation, and decision making. He is co-author of a book, The Dissertation, From Beginning to End, published by Oxford University Press. He was the founding director of the Center for Collaborative Social Work at Georgia State and as principal investigator on the school's professional excellence and child welfare education grants. Lyons received his doctoral degree in social work from SUNY Buffalo and earned his master's degree in social work and advanced diploma in education at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. And you'll notice a little bit of accent when he does address you. No, you won't. <laughs> uh, Joe May. Um, Dr. May is the Chancellor of the Dallas County Community College District, uh, 17th Chancellor. Uh, Dr. May assumed his duties in February of 2014. He brings a strong commitment to improve the Dallas economy by helping to grow middle class jobs. He is known both nationally and internationally as a result of his relentless advocacy for the role of community colleges in solving today's most challenging social issues. As the first member of his family to attend college, uh, Joe realized the profound impact that higher education had not only on his life but also on society in general. Inspired by this, May uh, helped start and then become the founding president of Rebuilding America's Middle Class, Ramsey, a national consortium of community colleges that is dedicated to ensuring everyone has the opportunity to pursue the American dream. May also help jumpstart a new economic investment and job creation through organizations like Ramsey as well as Combase. Combase is a consortium of leading community and technical colleges across the United States sharing innovative solutions to meet the challenges of our rapidly changing economy. Um, Joe was also influential in bringing the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program to Dallas, as well as a significant grant from J.P. Morgan Chase for Project OnRamp, which trains certified nurse assistants to become patient care technicians so that they are able to earn up to 20% higher salaries. May previously served as president of the Louisiana Community and Technical College System, president for the Colorado Community College System, and president of Pueblo Community College. He also served in leadership roles at Saul Ross State University, Navarro College, and uh, Vernon College. Uh, May started his higher ed career in 1978 as an adjunct faculty member at Cedar Valley College in Dallas, so he's come full circle. A native of East Texas, May earned his doctorate in education from Texas A&M University Commerce. He also holds Master of Education and Bachelor of Science degrees from Stephen F. Austin, and you will not hear an accent from Joe May. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm going to ask Kareem to go ahead and begin. The idea is we don't have any PowerPoint. We wanted to stay on target, make our presentations, but then spend as much time as we possibly can to answer and respond to your questions and comments. So with that. Do you want us to stay here? Uh, you're welcome to sure. stay right there. Hi, I'm, I'm Corrine, and on you, my handout is on your table. It looks like this. It didn't make the packet, but it will be on, your, uh, on the website. Um, so thank you, Mary, for that. Um, thank you, uh, Bruce, by the way, for that nice introduction. So I won't spend much time talking about the university, but it is important to understand the context from which we come. And so instead of giving more numbers about university, I thought I would kick you, tell you a really quick story that sort of exemplifies um, our, our students. So about three years ago, uh, on commencement day, my husband decided to um, have a triple bypass. We had just arrived to Texas. I mean, didn't exactly decide, but whatever. Um, so I come to the hospital and I was wearing TWU uh, sweatshirt and the nurse that walks in his room says, well, what's with TWU? I said, well, I'm the brand new chancellor or whatever. She says, well, I'd like to tell you my story. She says, I arrived here seven to eight years ago with $100 in my pocket. I had four children in tow and uh, I had been kicked out. She was from St. Louis. So she said, I did some research and I figured that if I came to TWU and studied nursing, I'd have about a 98% chance to pass the national exam. So the odds were in my favor. 
she decided to come. And also we have family housing. So she was able to live there with her, her children. And um, she, she says to this day, her children still think of this experience as this uh, really have great memories. She was also worried about going to class because she thought she was going to be the only older woman. I guess she was in 27 or something. And uh, so she showed up in class and there were many other women just like her. And the faculty were used to this and so when, if she had to stay home for a sick kid, um, they would call and say, make sure that you follow up, there's this homework, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this, obviously she graduated since she's now a nurse at the hospital where my husband was and she looks at me all teary eyed and she says, you know, what you don't realize, you didn't just change my life. You changed the life of my kids and every generation after that. And I think that at that moment, it still gives me goosebumps when I think about it, but at that moment, I really understood the mission and, and, and the population that we serve at Texas Women's University. As Bruce says, 90% of our students are, are women. And so when you look at that and you look at that potential and they're the ones who are going to be caring for the kids, making decisions about education, et cetera. So the, the potential of having an impact on society if we do this right, um, as Jeff Salingo was talking earlier, is really huge. Um, besides the, the, the fact that our gender population, we have about 90%, we look exactly like Texas in terms of the demographics, and you have that on your handout. Um, the, the type of students that we have, I think of them in three different categories. First, we have our, the first time in college, you know, the typical 18-year-old that come to school, but that's us, the smaller portion of our students. Over 50% of our undergrads are transfer students from Joe's community colleges from all the different community colleges around. We, we have a huge uh, number of transfer students and they do really, really well at, at TW. That, that it's, it's a really important part of our population. 35% of our students are graduate students, which is also very unusual uh, for an institution of higher ed. And I think it speaks to what um, Jeff was talking about earlier, where people continue to pursue degrees and certificates and, and whatnot. And um, so a really large population of our students are those, uh, even though he doesn't like the word students, what did he call them? Learners. So um, uh, maybe I should uh, adopt that. The, the type of programs, about half of our majors pursue health-related uh, fields. So again, very much tied to, to um, <coughs> the employment um, sectors of uh, high need. We're very fortunate that 85% uh, of our students within the first year of graduation either uh, have a job in Texas or uh, go on to graduate school. So it's a very high percentage. And we, they also earn the second highest salaries of uh, uh, any institution in, in Texas. So if you compare that with one of the lowest, um, most affordable uh, institutions in Texas and then the highest salaries, it's a good ROI. I guess I'm proud of that. The way I'd like to look at the affordability piece <clears throat> is I, I think about that in three different buckets. First, you have the upfront cost, what it takes to attend college, right? The typical that we think about, tuition and uh, uh, room and board, et cetera. You have the ROI at the end, which is really important. In other words, when you have that degree, are you gonna be able to get a job and is it going to be a good job, right? So the employment, the employability, the marketable skills, all that. But the part of that I'd like to focus on is what I call the middle section the middle bucket, uh, because I think those are strategies that we all can um, uh, address and, 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 and think about more carefully. And at TWU, we've really taken a comprehensive institutional approach to this uh, and trying to make, keep the individual costs while keeping the individual costs lower. So if you look at that middle section, this is really where we look at the whole student. And, and Jeff actually set this up really, really well. I thought, wow, he's, I could think of either he's stealing my thunder or he's really setting me up perfectly for this. Um, but it's really all of those life skills. It's everything. If you think of the low to mid income, income students, they walk a very tight line. You all know this. Something happens, your car breaks down, and all of a sudden, you know, it's easy to fall off the cliff. So how do we keep them afloat while they are with us? So I think there are many, many things that impact affordability besides the pure tuition number that's up front. And so that's what I'd like to talk about. And I think of those within that middle section, two buckets, again. One deals with life. Uh, and if you look at uh, on your handout, it's on the back of your handout. It says uh, keeping value high. It's uh, the, left, the left section there. Deals with different strategies that we've implemented to, to address these life issues. Um, so if you think about 
uh, what impacts a student. You know, is food, transportation, in our case, kids, uh, you know, the cost of uh, having kids, health, and the financial management. Those are all aspects that are really impacting whether or not they're going to succeed. And, and, and if you think about it, that's what impacts the affordability because again, again, if they leave the university without a degree, now really that's, that's worse because now they have debt and no degree. So that's not acceptable. Uh, one of the programs that I wanted to mention to you is what we call our frontier, uh, the program for our frontier students. These are students who have aged out of foster care so they're pretty much homeless. As you know, uh, in Texas and in the rest of the nation, they, their tuition is waived, so they can go to college for free. However, and this is really important to think about this, because here college is, for them, college is free. Only 2% of them graduate. 2%, that's in Texas and nationally, even though the cost has been removed. So clearly there are many, many other factors that impact, and, and Jeff alluded to many of them, time management, financial management, just how to, uh, how to deal with all of these aspects, but also the counseling, just dealing with, with different situations. Um, not even to, to mention the fact that when the dorms are closed, as many universities do, we, they close the dorms for uh, repairs or whatnot during the, during the break, where do these students go? So we are keeping our dorms open year round. We've partnered with several uh, local agencies that help with the students. We, we have a, a special areas where they can meet, talk with other uh, students in their situation. Uh, we have special coaching. And I'm proud to say that our graduation is over 50% for those students. Now think about that, from 2% to 50%, that's pretty dramatic. And so this is, again, it's a, an example of how all of those other aspects of what we do while the students are with us is really what matters. And we like to think of it as um, thinking of the whole student, and we've, we've coined this the, the, the well-being initiative. And uh, it, some of you may be familiar with the Gallup Purdue survey that came out two years ago. It talks very similarly to what Jeff mentioned this morning about the things that really matter to, to people. Uh, when they interviewed alumni of uh, universities, the, all these alumni had debt, and they asked, what is it? Was your education worth it? And if so, what made it worth it? And all of the aspects that he talked about, like the relationship, the financial management, having you know, a sense of purpose, all of those are aspects that we are really focusing on. And at first blush, it doesn't look like that has to do with affordability and cost, but it does, as I think Jeff made a really good point, and I don't need to reiterate that. So uh, still in that life section that we're talking about, so I talked about the foster students. We have emergency funds available for, you, the, the, you know, the student have, has the, their car breaks down or, or a fire in the apartment or whatnot. Emergency funds that can help them really stay afloat uh, for a while. Um, holiday gift program, that sounds like a very minor thing, but with so many women on campus who have children, we have a massive program where the faculty and staff uh, buy gifts. We know exactly the age of the kids, what the, the, the gender, what they, what they need. And so the campus buys all of these holiday gifts. That sounds minor, but that is one less expense for the students, um, and, and which is really important because every mom wants to buy her kids gifts. So this is now something they can use for another purpose. Food pantry. We all have read about food insecurities, and I know you're familiar with that at your own institutions. That is a very thriving program on campus, and I believe that also um, helps with the affordability of campus. Transportation. We uh, give public transportation training, how to use public transportation, uh, how to you know, utilize this effectively because, so you don't, not everyone needs to have a car. Um, we also don't charge a transportation fee and we have a very, very low parking fee. Uh, it's $70 a year. It's almost, I really think it's too low, but uh, <laughs> I know that our students really appreciate that. Um, uh, financial wellness programming. You, uh, you can look at some of the other items here. There's one I will highlight too, is the outdoors program. And you might think, what does that have to do? And so it's part of this health and well-being initiative. We really push our students in, in participating in outdoor activities. Um, and there is a, so this year we won second place in the national outdoor campus challenge uh, among all of the institutions in the country uh, in terms of participations, activities and whatnot. And I think it's important because it's part of that health and well-being uh, and, and what we need to do at the universities, and Jeff 
uh, reminded us of that this morning too. It's not just uh, making sure that the students leave with a degree, but that they have learned not only large, but also behaviors. I think the time that they're with us is an opportunity for, the, for us to help change their behavior in, in terms of what it means to have healthy nutrition or physical activity, financial management, whatever it may be. Uh, and so that's, that's a big focus, I think, because if, they ha if we do that right, then they will be able to be thriving citizens. And as I said with my earlier story, not only those students will benefit, but their, 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 their children and every generation after that. So it's a huge impact on society. And in Texas, especially with the growth that we're experiencing, the growth that's at the lower and mid-income mid level, I think those are really, really important uh, aspects. On the right side of the uh, columns there that you have, there's a focus on academics. So I, mentioned here strategies related to life, what I call life. The other side is strategies that are more specifically connected to academic programs. There are about five strategies highlighted in there that relate directly to cost. One of them I, I will mention first is our uh, partnerships with community colleges. We have about uh, 230 deep pathways agreements with 28 different community colleges. Um, and and I, the reason why that's important, and Joe talks about that a lot, is a lot of students in community colleges leave with many more hours than they can ever utilize later. And so there's so, sort of wasted hours in the sense that it, it's expensive and they can be used. So by having really tight pathways and partnerships with community colleges, we avoid that. We're in the process right now of finalizing um, something that I think it's really novel uh, is an integrated degree with a particular community college in, in two different disciplines, nursing and education, where the, the, all of the courses and degrees have been planned between the community college and the higher ed institution, and they completely integrated. So the students, when they start here, they know exactly how they continue, and everything builds on each other. It's not just you get two years here and then two years at higher ed, but it's, it, it truly is integrated, and I'm hoping we'll be able to do more of those. Um, but that, I think that's a really meaningful uh, um, way to achieve also more affordability. In this particular integrated program, students take more hours at a community college, actually, which makes it more affordable total for them. Uh, but I, I, So there's novel ways for us to, to think about these uh, partnerships. Um, internships, paid internships, very important. Uh, about 59% uh, of our students enjoy paid internships. And I think that really contributes, again, to that affordability during the time that they're with us. Same as work study. Very important that they, if we can keep the students on campus to work and earn, they're less likely to drop out because it's not as hard to go to work, come back to class. They stay right there. It's easier to stay in classes. So all of those things are, are strategies that I think are really important. Let's see what else I have on here. The uh, job shadowing, the, well, the, the Jeff talked about the, the uh, career services, I think are really critical. We have some partnerships with foundations that are really helpful also in giving the students emergency funds. Again, uh, one of the foundations, the Gorley Foundation, focuses specifically on helping single parents uh, who have, uh, obviously have children and, and who have need and to help them, giving them that extra little cash they might need or uh, if, if something happens. And we, listening to students and serving the students, those strategies that might not seem huge make a huge difference in their lives in really keeping them afloat. Having lots of courses uh, online and having the hybrid situation so where it's more easily accessible for our students. And then another aspect is we don't really offer remedial classes for credit. So students don't have to pay for courses that they can't really use as part of their degree. But what we have instead is in our Pioneer Excellence Center is, uh, is specific areas to work on their writing. We have the right site uh, on campus, a, a center that helps with science learning. Uh, so we have specific areas where they can go for coaching, mentoring, uh, help, uh, individual help, but not they won't be spending their um, money on, on credit hours that aren't necessarily needed. So I can let you read some more of those um, strategies here, but I think uh, focusing really on what happens when the students are with us and, and focusing on these life skills that they will need when they leave is, is where we are uh, betting on money. Let's put it this way. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Peter Lyons to go next. If you don't mind, I'm going to stand. Sure. <clears throat> I'm very short-sighted and uh, 
it's easier for me to read these crib notes when I'm standing and sitting down. Um, I almost want to say what she said, <laughs> uh, because there's so much overlap between the, the types of issues that we face. But before I do that, I wanted to just check the floor. Um, I have a family background. My great-great-grandfather, Joe Finnegan, came to Texas in what became the Houston area at the turn of the uh, 19th century. He was on a platform very similar to this, a wooden one, in front of a group of people from Texas when the, the whole thing collapsed and he fell right through. If it hadn't been for the rope around his neck, he would have broken both of his legs. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have two purposes for telling that. It's a, it's a joke, right? I have two purposes for telling that. One is it gives you a couple of seconds to get used to my East Texas accent. <laughs> And the other is, I told that joke about 10 years ago at a conference in San Francisco, and somebody at the back shouted, he was a horse thief! <laughs> and one of the people on the panel from me from New York City said, you must be from Texas. <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> he was. Each individual place has its own individual problems and its own individual resolutions, solutions, ways that we deal with them. So... Some of what I'm going to talk about are the specific things that we've done at Georgia State, but that's not to say that these are the active therapeutic ingredients that you should grab and take to your institutions. I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, Georgia State is a, for those of you who don't know, it's in downtown Atlanta. It's a uh, research, very high university. We've gone uh, very quickly from uh, $40 million in, uh, federal f in, in uh, research funding to $140 million in less than 10 years. Um, but we've gained most national prominence um, for student success initiatives. And the student success initiatives, essentially, we've managed to increase the graduation rate faster than anybody else in the country. 10 years ago, it was 32%. Now it's up 53, 54, 55, depending on the, the last couple of years. Um, we don't have an achievement gap between students from different races. Uh, we don't have an achievement gap from students from different socioeconomic circumstances, and we don't have an achievement gap, gap for uh, first-generation students and non-first-generation students. We are a, a majority-minority institution. We don't have a, a, a majority, essentially. Um, we have, you know, we're located about half a mile away from the Martin Luther King uh, uh, National Park Center, is essentially Martin Luther King birthplace and the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Baptist Church. This week, we had Betsy DeVos on campus. Uh, a few months ago, we had Bill Gates on campus. And it's because of that, the, the fast-growing graduation rate and the no achievement gap that we've got people visiting us. We also graduate more African-American students than any institution in the country that has a campus. Um, we graduate over 2,000 African-American students uh, and have done for the last two years more than 2,000 African-American students. So I want to talk about some of the, the, I noticed that Jeff mentioned he was a journalist and he had how, where, what, when, and why, and, and I've done something similar. I'm going to talk about three initiatives, but I, the details of those initiatives are in the two-page handout that's, that, you, that you've got there. I want to talk around some of those initiatives as well as just about this is what we did and these were the outcomes, because they were the issues that we faced and the solutions that we came up with were our solutions and we had our results. I couldn't guarantee that that would work for you. Um, there are lots and lots of things that happen in the background that go along with these things that don't make it, typically don't make it into presentations, don't make it into journal articles. Jeff wrote a chapter about Georgia State in one of his books. Um, we've had numerous, we've got the Boston Consulting Group, who if you've ever met them are all 12 years old and under. Uh, come to campus, you know, we, we've had more than 200 institutions visit over the last couple of years saying, you know, what's the magic ingredient? And there isn't one. Um, if there is one, it's that we look at the data. One of the things in the, 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 the very long bio for me, <laughs> I apologize for that, was that I, uh, in my previous position, I've been with Georgia State for 20 years, which is why my accent is so Georgia, you all. Um, and... The creation of that single, it wasn't a single authoritarian database, although it feels like that now that I'm on the other side of it. It's the single authoritative database 
We used to have nine colleges and nine deans who had their own data systems. And when we'd say, it looks like this, they'd go, oh, no, it doesn't. And then you could, so we couldn't make any changes. So we created a data warehouse. And I used to play a game with the president and say, tell me that the data warehouse will be the single authoritative data system for the university. And he knew the game, so he'd repeat it. And then I'd go into meetings with deans and say, the president has said that the data warehouse will be the single authoritative data warehouse for the university. Is that true? And the president would go, yes. And it was, so it was a game, but we started to uh, pull together data and publish the data on, you can get into, we have a system called iPort, lots of it's public facing. Uh, and you can get into iPort and look at all kinds of Georgia State data. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of screens and thousands of permutations of things that you can select. And of course, when we first started to use it, the deans would say, the data aren't accurate. And my response as associate provost was, it's your data. We're pulling it from your data systems. So if it's not right, that's a good thing. If we've got two different numbers, we can have a conversation about how we arrived at those two different numbers and how we get there, how we arrive at one that we agree upon, rather than us having uh, the same number and both being wrong. Um, so at the, back, at the back of lots and lots of Georgia State's student success has been a real attention to data that's shared, that people recognize and say, okay, that is our graduation rate. Okay, they are our students because the department chairs can dig down to the student level. When I've said it's public facing, of course, you won't be able to, do, to dig down to that level. Excuse me, I'll just kick this very valuable crystal ball around here. Um, the, uh, the warehouse presents data and the data are incredibly useful. And one of the things that I know as a faculty member, department chair, associate provost, vice provost, and then I've got two jobs, I'm vice, vice provost of the university and, and, and the dean, so I'm both the poacher and the gamekeeper. If you make the data available, most people won't look at it. Or they'll look at it and they won't do anything. So while I've said we've got tens of thousands of data elements that people can look at, not everybody does. What we found is we have to identify the crucial elements that we want people to pay attention to and send them and say, look at this, tell me what you're going to do about it. I'll give you a couple of examples. And again, I, I may touch briefly on the three things that are in the handout, but they're very detailed and you can see what we did. Um, every week we send, at this time of the year, it's enrollment for the spring semester, we send out an Excel spreadsheet to all of the deans and then all of the department chairs. And the Excel spreadsheet looks at course enrollment. We've got 50,000 students now that we've merged essentially a two-year college, which was the former Georgia Perimeter College, and made that another college within the university. We've got 50,000 students. So we've got lots and lots of sections that we need to offer in lots and lots of places. And one of the things that we noticed several years ago was that if the student wanted to do biology 1101, biology 1102, by April of the spring semester, all of the seats for the fall semester were full. So incoming students who needed these courses be to progress couldn't sign up. So we started to pay attention to what are the other places where essentially it's that we have a course availability uh, series of screens in iPort that the chairs don't look at. So what we do is we can do, click and download them to an Excel spreadsheet and then highlight the ones where they're 100% full. And 90%, we just put, color code them. Red is 100% full, yellow is 90% full, green is you know, 70% full. And with a request to, here are the courses that are not available for students, in, in, incoming students, pay attention to the ones that are the core that the students really need and tell me what you're gonna do about it by the close of business tomorrow. And it's time consuming, but it makes them pay attention. It's not an appropriate answer. We have six campuses. It used to be an appropriate answer to say, well, there are no courses available on this campus, but the same, no sections available on this campus, but there are on this other campus. It's not acceptable. That's based on what the faculty need. What we want is something that's based upon what the students need. So it, we, what we're trying to do is, is present data that will uh, make a cultural change. Another one of the things that people, widely available in iPort, people can look at this. It is the, these are the most widely used screens in iPort we can check how many clicks are on them. We can also see who is looking at them. These are the most widely used screens and they're used by students. 
not faculty. It's the course distribution. So you can see the distribution of A's, B's, C's. So we can actually aggregate that and look at the DFW rate. So one of the things that we do on a regular basis is send every semester, send a report to department chairs and say, for all of these sections, you've got a DFW rate that ranges. You know, we've uh, uh, been consolidated with Georgia Perimeter College. It's now called Perimeter College for just less than two years. And we have some courses where there is a 100% DFW rate. Now, that's not OK. <laughs> But nobody was paying attention to this. The data were there, and people could have looked, but nobody did. So it's in, in, one of the things that's around all of these other issues that, we're going to t that I'm going to talk about is you have to put the data right in front of people and demand a response. I, when I say demand, the first time we did this, we just sent out the list of all the DFW, all the sections where the DFW rate was greater than 30% and said, you have a range here from you know, 5% to 60%. Please pay attention. Have a conversation with the faculty about what this means. Didn't lay any blame anywhere. Just said, you need to talk about this. And we'd get things like a faculty member who would only give two opportunities for a student to see what their grade was, the midterm exam and the final exam. So that's a, an education. You know, this, this is something for the faculty. They're not all math majors. You know, they need, may need more feedback earlier on. But these are the things that you're all inside the baseball game, so this is inside baseball conversation. You'll see lots and lots of things that Jeff and other people have written about Georgia State that talk about all these fantastic initiatives, and they are. But without all of the prompting, pushing, prodding in the background. So you, you, you see we have this, uh, the advisement system that we developed with the Educational Advisory Board. This is a series of uh, 800 alerts on every student that attract every night, real time. So we can see if a student is off track. If a student says they're a, a nursing major and they take a course which is not on the pathway for, they sign up for a course that's not on the pathway for a nursing major, we'll send them 15 minutes, he said. We'll send them, <laughs> <laughs> we'll send an alert to the advisor, an alert to the student saying, you need to talk. And we have, last year we had 52,000 face-to-face conversations with students. Not all 50,000 students, but the same students multiple times. Talking with them about what this means. We, you, know, you, can, you can see the results in the package that I've given you. We also uh, have this, these Panther Retention Grant, similar to the emergency financial aid. We started these about five years ago. President Becker donated $40,000 and said, do something innovative with it. So we started to look at students who were in good academic standing, who had one or two semesters left and hadn't registered for the following semester, and called them and said, you know, you're in good academic standing, you've not, standing, you've not registered, why? And they'd say, well, I don't have the money, uh, usually less than $1,000. And then we'd say, uh, of course, the president's not here, the provost's not here, Tim Rennick's not here as the other vice provost. So this was all me. <laughs> This, this was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, of course, um, would call these students and say, we'll give you the money. And the most common response was the students hung up. They thought it was a scam. <laughs> we got over that. So now we've given something like just over 9,000 of these mini grants. You can see the results in the, in the handout that's in there. But the, 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 the results are that we've got a lot more students in the university than, uh, and coming back to the university than we, than we would have had without them. Last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, it's just a, a comment. This is not social science. It's organizational change. And really, I don't care which of the combination of therapeutic ingredients make the change as long as the change happens. So I, don't, I couldn't tell you what proportion of improvement in the graduation rate is a function of this while we hold all the other things constant. And I don't care. Uh, as long as it's going up. Last example, uh, I said we had Betsy DeVos here. We had Bill Gates here, uh, at Bill Gates at, at Georgia State, and we have a wonderful picture of Bill Gates with one of our students' iPhones. And I, want the, I wanted the caption to be, where does Bill Gates go to learn about technology? Or, or uh, how do you get Bill Gates to uh, adopt an iPhone? But they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me have that, uh, either of those. What he was looking at was this chatbot technology that we've adapted. You know, we, of course, we, we partner with, with industry, the Education Advisory Board, Admit Hub, and so on, to develop these things. We've done two things. One is we track 
All of the, for us, there are 14 different points in the application process where students can fall off the, off the map. We actually look at where they fall off. Usually it's around the FAFSA, and we call them and say, you got this far and no further, why? What can we do to help? And the other thing is we have 2,000 frequently asked questions that students can text into a robot system and within seven seconds, they'll get an answer around issues like financial aid, housing, admissions, course scheduling, things like that. And that was what Bill Gates was looking at. And I'd like to say thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm, I'll be delighted to avoid any questions that you come up with later. <laughs> Dr. May. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good, good morning to everyone. It is great to be here and good, uh, good, good to see you. And you can tell I am the one without the accent uh, here. So, uh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I appreciate Bruce mentioning two things uh, in, in my, uh, my introduction. One, that I am from East Texas and uh, uh, I grew up there. And, and two, I was the first in my family to attend college because I think it's uh, uh, important to, to think about those days back in the early 1970s, and some of you will relate to this that are closer to my age, when my, I went to college because my mother encouraged me, pushed me from my, my earliest days to do that. But when I went to college, she was worried I wouldn't <coughs> stay because the reality was in those days, 75% of middle class jobs required no more than a high school diploma. All my friends were driving new cars. Uh, they were uh, getting married, they were uh, buying homes because jobs were plentiful and available and only a few people really needed a college education. So the temptation was strong. Fast forward to today, when we look at the, uh, the jobs in our community, we went back and looked at the 122,000 jobs created in North Texas from September 2015 to September 2016 and nearly 70% required some type of post-secondary credential. Now that's important in framing this because when we look at the numbers, we see that we're a long way uh, from, from achieving that goal of what we need. So 60 by 30 in many of our communities is not even enough to simply get us to where we, uh, where we need to be. And I say that because I live in a community that's really a tale of two cities. Uh, we have one that is booming and growing. You can't uh, uh, get around because of the uh, construction that's taken place. And we have another part of our community for which it has the third highest poverty rate in the nation, growing at a, at a rapid rate, uh, people being left behind by the economy unable to participate. So I say that in framing as our board and we've looked at what is really our role in the community. And so we've, we've set forth, and you have it in the handout, really five uh, priorities that, that drive us. One, uh, leading the umbrella is 60 by 30. We believe that that is a, a goal. Secondly, we've said that we must address as a priority income disparity uh, in our community, uh, that we must uh, create a system of navigation that helps uh, individuals, and I'll mention that, uh, uh, get through the, not the college, get through life in such a way that can ha help them achieve their goals. Uh, third, that we partner with a, what we call an integrated higher education network that's really designed, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in, in, in a few moments, uh, to help people meet their needs. And so it's really a shift in every one of these from institution-centric to individual-centric in, in terms, of, as you've heard from the, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the, the other speakers, and to really pay attention to the workforce pipeline to make sure that we're aligning our programs, resources, and what we're doing to, to meet those needs. Because we really believe that we have four responsibilities. Uh, the, the first is that we must prepare our community to succeed. And that means economic success. So if we're not aligned with the needs, we can't help our community grow. Secondly, we must help business to prosper because the only way to have a successful community is create new jobs and wealth within that community. So we, we focus on that. Third, we believe if we get those first two right, we can inspire individuals to achieve and, and go forward. So as we, as we look at this, and ultimately we all benefit by having an improved quality of life, I say that because we've really taken 
I would say a lot of our model from the healthcare industry. You know, years ago, uh, hospitals operated as standalone hospitals. You can't find that anymore. They've all become part of healthcare networks, even if they're individually accredited. They're working together because of a couple of reasons. Just like today, 75% of the jobs require, uh, or uh, up to 70% require post secondary education, <laughs> that means one institution impossible to do it. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, there's not the resources, there's not the talent, there's not the expertise, there's not the ability to do that. So the way that we're having to do that now is look at intentionally uh, creating networks that work to solve the problems of individuals, our community, and how we, how we make that happen. So we've really shifted our organization, and we talk about, as you see in our goals, a network of higher education, meaning we don't have to do it all. Uh, but we but we have to make sure that we are solving the problems. I'm just to explain a couple of things we've done and get get into the what uh, uh, and, and how we go about it. As we got into this, we realized we didn't know everything about our students that uh, we needed to know. So we we decided to do an in-depth student experience study. We put out a call for our faculty and staff and others to volunteer to be trained as researchers to shadow students uh, over the course of six months. The students were keeping daily journals. They were interviewed on a weekly basis basis we did focus groups to really understand what was going on and very quickly we had insight of things that were had been anecdotal in the past but now were documented as fact we now know that 39 percent of our students are missing meals on a regular basis we know that 13 percent of our students are virtually homeless as their sofa surfing uh, through uh, uh, through through the community uh, we know that transportation is a is a uh, is a challenge and we know that they completely misunderstand funding debt uh, and, uh, and, and, and finances. We, we know that there are many other barriers and challenges that get in the way. And so as we looked at what's going on in our community, we saw a, a troubling trend because while we need to be growing the jobs in Dallas County, we go back and looked at uh, the most recent three years, we're actually producing less credentials now than we were three years ago. Uh, in the overall community, <coughs> meaning that we're not having the type of impact that we uh, that we want to have. And so we realize we have to look at it differently. And it's not just about our students because we, we understand the ones coming in the door, but there's a whole group. And we've decided a different term because the people that aren't coming to us, we've labeled non-consumers because they're not potential students. They're not uh, uh, buying what we're selling at all. And so now we've got to find some new ways to reach and bring them in. And if we do, they're going to accelerate the challenges that we see. You know, we, uh, we, we've taken an in-depth look at every single high school. And I, I've got a chart that's actually in the, uh, the, on the thumb drive uh, that will show you school by school the uh, level of economic disadvantage. You'll see schools at 99%, meaning that in this room, uh, that's uh, probably about two people uh, would not be uh, economically disadvantaged uh, in, in the, these high schools. So the impact is, is, uh, is severe. So as we look at this, we've realized that we've got to restructure, redesign, because it's not just about affordability, kind of, quite honestly, it's really about breaking down those barriers and focusing on every single one of them uh, that, that seems to stubble and, and uh, trip people up. So I'm, I'm going to mention those a couple, then I'm going to kind of maybe knit it together. So you'll see there's been some publicity that uh, our board voted to now provide free public <coughs> transportation passes, not free to us, but, uh, but free to the student for uh, we serve about 165,000 students a year in credit and non-credit uh, programs. 123,000 are eligible for these passes, uh, both credit and non-credit. We don't, we don't limit that. Uh, like uh, was mentioned uh, by Kareen, we partner with the North Texas Food Bank. We uh, uh, put, have put pantries on our campus and we partner now with a mobile uh, pantry that uh, that that uh, can get out and, and address the needs in our urban areas where we really don't have the space and, and the ability uh, to provide that. Uh, we've partnered with a, a group out of here in Austin, funny name, uh, Aunt Bertha. Uh, but uh, what they do is uh, that we've embedded in our website. Uh, they they track and provide information to individuals on services available. If you need free legal aid, if you need health care, if you need child care, if you need transportation, if you need mental health, whatever it is. And so while we don't know who they are, 
we, we get all the data. So we now, can, I can tell you on a weekly basis how many of our students are looking for uh, food, how many of them are looking for housing, how many of them are, are struggling with mental health and, uh, and looking at issues or need legal health uh, to make that. So that's informing us on our advising end. Uh, and uh, as we look at that, we've also are doing push technology now as well, partnering with 350 not-for-profits that uh, they can actually access our information uh, about the college right there in their office if that would benefit someone on, uh, as part of their, their website. And have uh, really redesigned, as discussed earlier, where we start our advising uh, with career information up front, planning for a job, not for a degree. Uh, we, we, we think that's uh, uh, crucial. But it, so we've, we've had to do some things that are very, very different in order to get there. And I, I'll sound disaggregated a bit, but so we've created a new position called Navigators. Uh, navigators are institutional agnostic positions. We don't really care where a student goes to college, we want to help them get to where they need to be. So we pulled this away from our seven colleges within the district. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, if they, if they need to go to TWU, we want to get them there. If they need to go to the University of North Texas, we want to get them there. We'll get our fair share in that process. But the trouble is, we, we know what happens when students walk in the door, they don't know which college to go to. They don't know what, uh, what uh, their needs are always. And the first thing an advisor tries to do is sell them on stuff at, at, at their institution. And, and uh, the students either leave confused uh, or go away and never come back anywhere uh, at the end of that process. So we want to really take that out of their, their hands. And then we've created something that you may have seen a little bit of publicity on called the Dallas County Promise. The focus gets on this on the money side of it, but it's not about a scholarship. Uh, the headlines will usually say that students enrolled at 31 of our partner high schools can attend college free. Uh, and that's a true statement. But the, the, the real issue there is a looking at partnership in a very different way and really redesigning it so that we get people not only understanding that there's a financial pathway uh, available for them, but we're preparing them. So we, uh, we, we, uh, we don't open it up to everyone. Uh, the, you have to be a partner high school committed uh, to hitting 60% strategies to hit 60% of your graduates earning a post-secondary degree. Uh, we partner with uh, many of those right now with our early college high schools, P-Tech high schools, business tech high schools, career academies, others that are there, but they're redesigned models. We start in the eighth grade with a boot camp with the uh, students coming out of high school. We focus on reading in the ninth grade year, writing in the sophomore year, math in the junior year, and so far, we uh, have 100% college ready uh, at the time they, they graduate. Uh, and these are, I'll tell you, the highest risk high schools, the highest risk students uh, in, in Dallas. We screen the opposite of creamy uh, to, uh, uh, to get there, and we're working our way up from the bottom of the list. But if those students on their senior year will commit to go to college, and we track that uh, uh, every single day, uh, we have a website that tracks it. Not for us, it's uh, again institutional agnostic, it's just simply committing. Uh, and uh, it's, if you look at it, it'll be under dallascountypromise.org, not uh, dccd.edu. Uh, uh, our partners are University of North Texas Dallas now, SMU uh, are, are partnering with us, but we have a half a dozen others that uh, want to join and also commit to providing education at no cost for students who meet certain criteria. They, uh, at, at that point, uh, they have to uh, then also complete the FAFSA by January of their senior year. And we track that on a weekly basis uh, to make sure, and we inform the high school by name their students that have completed the FAFSA and where they are in the process and how, what their percentage is, and we show them where they are uh, year to date over a year ago. And this year, we're about 10% above uh, where we were uh, a year ago because what we've learned is college attendance almost perfectly correlates with FAFSA completion during the senior year, almost perfectly. Uh, if you don't complete the FAFSA, you're not going to college. And so we've, we've uh, uh, focused on that to make that happen. And then we've uh, set up mentors uh, that during the senior year, they have to uh, meet with the mentors at least uh, three times. You miss any of those, you're not eligible. 
uh, and, and we're hard and fast on the, uh, the rules because we want the students to be successful going forward. So with that, if they complete that, for everyone at those high schools, they can enroll with the Dallas County Community College District and be scholarship. Uh, they can enroll at University of North Texas, Dallas and be scholarship. They can enroll at SMU in, in certain areas and be scholarship uh, for that. So they start out of the eighth grade knowing that there's not going to be any additional cost uh, for them to, to make, uh, make that happen. And we combine that with free transportation. We combine that uh, with other uh, food and other resources to, uh, to and, and as well as other barriers that we're attempting to address to make sure people understand that, that uh, a higher education can be a reality, even when they may not know anyone that's, uh, that's been successful in a higher education setting. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, questions? Mary has the mic. Um, I'm really interested to know how are you funding the free, uh, th those scholarships for those students and how many students have taken advantage of that? Uh, th thank you. Uh, and yeah, because I didn't have time to go into the details. A couple of things. What? What uh, you need to realize that at community colleges in Texas, most of them are so affordable that if the student will complete the FAFSA, they'll get thirty-five dollars to $3,700 a year, which actually in most cases will cover the cost of tuition fees books. Uh, at, at, it won't necessarily at four-year institutions, but, but it will at, at community colleges. So students and their families don't realize by simply not completing the FAFSA, they're leaving money to cover their cost on the table. Now, we're fortunate. We, we've had a uh, scholarship fund. Uh, there, there are really three parts, and I mentioned the early college high schools are career academies. There's also one called Rising Star. Uh, we've had a Rising Star scholarship uh, where we have about 30 Two million, which is enough dollars that for anyone that gets missed, we'll cover the cost. If you're a DACA student and not eligible, we'll cover the cost. If your uh, uh, if your income is too high, we'll cover the cost uh, of that. And so we we do that with private dollars. Uh, the fourth, uh, the third scholarship that we're just kicking off is called Level Up, which is for adults. Same model, except you have a, a gap in your education. We're in a twenty million campaign, which will give us enough to do the same thing. Only there, we're we're focusing. The those on right now five specific career pathways uh, as, as we go into it. But we've raised the dollars locally, but leveraging the Pell, you know, we, we, we realized we had half of our students attending free, only we didn't tell them uh, that uh, uh, b before. And it's simply communicating and starting that much earlier in the process so that people understand the process of higher education funding of, uh, of uh, Pell grants and of scholarships. I have a question for Dr. Faden. Uh, you talked about the middle bucket and the life skills. I was curious if uh, networking is one of the skills that you focus on uh, for these students, uh, you know, how to do it and the importance of doing it. Thank you. So, the, so I mentioned the Gallup Purdue survey, and, and one of the aspects is relationships, so we call it relationships. Really, in terms of um, connecting with other people, and, and a lot of it is, so Jeff talked about uh, the importance of learn by doing. So it happens to be the motto at TWU. It's actually etched in one of our oldest buildings. We learn to do by doing. And so really getting involved in actual projects, uh, community service, and, and, and connecting with, our, with other students on and this specific student orgs, and then areas where the students really can get together and build those relationships. But it's, it's something that's part of um, our goal in, in the, the health and well-being initiative to really talk about that because all the research from the Gallup Purdue survey demonstrated that that is one of the aspects that the students will be in their life much more successful in their relationships when they have experienced certain things in college and so that's kind of what we're using as our guideline absolutely yeah Mary let me ask you a question how much time do we have left five minutes good so we have five minutes left so any other questions Yes, sir. Uh, sir, we want you to have a microphone. Okay. Uh, uh, for Joe May, uh, how, how, does, uh, how did you get the penetration in the high schools to, uh, you know, in these, these schools that have 98% poverty level students, uh, how did you get the cooperation to do that? 
one, I, I think we, we, we realized we had to change part of the model. And uh, when we created DallasCountyPromise.org, uh, we intentionally took it out of the district and parked it in a, a nonprofit because we realized we were, we were spending a lot of money every year going into the schools, like every one of our colleges do, helping students complete the FAFSA. And, uh, and we partnered, but we weren't seeing the numbers change. We were stuck at a little over 40 percent, and uh, we, we, we used Boston Consulting Group to help us benchmark the country. And we believe we could hit 75 percent is where we uh, uh, could could target and be successful with that, and and so we we realized what was happening if, if somebody from uh, El, El Centro College showed up and said I'm here to help you complete the FAFSA, uh, 95 percent of the students said Well, I'm not going there, and uh, and and it became institution centric, not problem centric and so by moving it out we uh, we we've really taken the position we don't care where they go uh, as long as they're 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 going somewhere and and therefore making that happen so the schools wanted and I got to tell you we, we did a soft launch of this we didn't know what the reaction would be we started with 31 high schools 9,000 seniors we're already at 6,000 having uh, signed on so we're already above a uh, 60% which is far for these schools uh, above where they they've been in the in, in the past as we as we look at it uh, getting there but we've had superintendents declare Dallas County uh, promise day by t-shirts for all their seniors to promote it uh, uh, the, uh, there's become a competition because we give every week, every principal, every superintendent, every parent, every student gets an email in terms of their progress. The student knows where they sit, the uh, school knows where they sit, the superintendent knows how their district is, is comparing. So that's how we've really gotten the buy-in on it. Thanks. Anybody else? Maybe one more. Joe, I have a kind of a follow-up question on the FAFSA and the parents and the students that are involved. Are you seeing, one, that there's a need for translating the FAFSA and helping? And yeah. if so, how are you doing sure. that? Sure. Uh, Dallas Independent School District is 71 percent Hispanic, so uh, that, that's certainly when we engage the parents, that's a, a, a big uh, a big issue. So that, that's part of that partnership with uh, K-12. They've solved some of those that we haven't uh, solved. So once we've engaged now, and, and I could go into more detail on it, but we actually have certain requirements that they, uh, that they need to uh, make with and commitments that they have to uh, make to us in order to be a part of it. And that's, that's part of that help that they provide. We do some of it too, but, but they're, they're right there on the ground. Okay. Would you mind uh, please joining me in uh, congratulating and thanking our panelists? Great job. Thank you.